Okay, are you ready? We have a test. Today is Yom Teruah, and the word Teruah is how many blasts? No, the word Teruah implies how many blasts of the shofar? How, how many? Okay, how, which one was three? Which one was one? Which one is nine? <laughs> okay, Takia is one long blast. Shevarim is three blasts. Okay, Terua is nine blasts. Now, what does the word Terua mean? A wake up, an alarm. Okay, war. Like a an, an, war is alarming. Okay, but I just want to make sure how every remembers the word Teruah. Now, let's take a look at Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2. We have special readings for Yom Teruah. It's not a Torah portion. It's special readings from the Torah. But look at Genesis 21, 2. Here we see the Lord visits Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bear Abraham a son in his old age at the, what? Set time. Hmm. If you know set time, that means it's a set time. Okay. It's a feast day. Now, what was the set time that Isaac was born? When was Isaac born? Okay, you got, everyone should remember. Okay, there, there are hints in the Bible, Isaac was born on Passover. Okay? <clears throat> it shows you in scriptures, uh, as, as you look at it, that it definitely was at Passover that God told him, and a year from now, at the set time, you will have the child. And a year later, at that set time, which was Passover, and if you remember, what did Lot serve Abraham when he, or the angels, when they went down there? unleavened bread okay so anyway this happened at passover so we see isaac who was a type of the messiah he's born at passover and here we have a miraculous birth of a son well isaac was born at a full moon of passover and he was bound on yom teruah at the new moon okay you always have to think in terms of timing you can look at the you know from the moon, uh, whether it's full or new, when the feast was. Now look at Genesis 21, 4 through 5. <clears throat> it says, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being how old? Eight days, as God had commanded him with the covenant of circumcision. On the eighth day they are to be circumcised, the boys. And then it says, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Wow, isn't that interesting? If Isaac was born on Passover, and Passover unleavened bread is how long? Eight days, Passover one, seven days of unleavened bread. He was circumcised on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the same time Israel crossed the Red Sea, like going through the birth canal. And they're born also. I want you to catch these parallels here. And here it says, Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. I think that is amazing too, that how old Abraham was at Passover. And then look at Genesis 21, 6. It goes on in the next verse and says, Sarah said, God has made me to laugh so that all that here will laugh with me. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. Everybody has a laughing place. Well, this was Abraham and Sarah's laughing place, the fact that God said they would have a kid. Now, the Hebrew word for laughter, which is what she was speaking, is the root word, the three-letter root word, it's Sakak. And that where is where you get the name Isaac from. 
The very word laughter is the root of Isaac's name. So they named him Laughter. That's what Isaac's name was because we saw Abraham had laughed. We see that Sarah has laughed. So they say, this is so funny, and we laughed. Now, why did they laugh? Well, guess what? How old was Sarah? 90. Well, do you know the word for laughter begins with the sade, which has a numerical value of 90, and the kuf is 100, which is how old Abraham was. So God takes a 90-year-old and a 100-year-old and produces the chet, which is life, and that's what they were laughing about. Only God can do that. And that's, here they're laughing because a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old get together and produce life, the letter chet, chai, okay, means life. Only, this is how you know there's a God. There could be no doubt. When you see all the intricacies, the math, and only God could do this. Okay, now Genesis 21, 14. It says, Abraham rose up early in the morning. Okay, Sarah says, Hagar, to Hagar, you get the heck out of here with your son Ishmael. Scram. And so, what does Abraham do? He rose up early in the morning. He took bread, a bottle of water. There's two people, Hagar and Ishmael. He gives them one bottle of water, some bread, and gave it to Hagar. Put it on her shoulder. Maybe it was a big bucket of water. And the child sent her away. She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, one of the things that's always amazed me, Abraham had like a thousand camels, a thousand sheep. Why did he only give Hagar a bottle of water and a piece of bread? You ever think about that? I mean, it's amazing with all of his wealth, why didn't he give her more? Why did he just give her a piece of, a loaf of bread, you know, and a jug of water? That doesn't seem very nice, but I'm sure... Sarah wasn't happy about the whole situation either. But look what happens in Genesis 21, 16 and 17. And she went and she sat down over against her son Ishmael a good way, as it were a bow shot. For she said, I don't want to see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. I mean, she's, here she's lifting up her voice, and she's weeping, but she doesn't care enough for her son to be with him. She wants to be by herself. And then it says, God heard the voice of the kid. Here she's lifting up her voice and weeping, and God doesn't even hear her. He just hears the voice of the kid. And then the angel of God calls out to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's your problem? <laughs> you know, don't be afraid. God has heard the voice of who? The child. I mean, here Hagar's weeping and crying and lifting up her voice, thinks she has it so tough. He's not even thinking about her kid. He's over there, doesn't say anything about him crying out, but God hears his cry, you know, and said, hey, it's all going to be good. And so look at verse 19 through 21. God opens her eyes. And she saw what? A well of water. What does Beersheba mean? Beersheba means uh, like seven wells of water. They were always there, but she had her eyes open to see them. How often does someone point something out to us we've never seen before, and then all of a sudden you see it, and then you can't unsee it? All right? But sometimes it takes someone else to point it out. How many of you men can't find something in the refrigerator? <laughs> Until your wife points it out. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's, it's amazing how so often in all of our lives, uh, when you look at art or when you look at different things, you don't see it. How many ever had the Highlights magazine when you were a kid? They always had the hidden pictures, and you had to find all the hidden pictures in them and things like that. Yeah, they're so much fun. Well, let's go to Genesis 21, 19 through 21 again. She sees... Uh, a well of water. She fills the bottle with water and she gives the lad a drink. And then God was with the lad. Doesn't say he was with Hagar, but he was with the lad and he grew and he dwelt in the wilderness. He became an archer. 
and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Okay, right here is the wilderness of Paran. Now here is Beersheba. He wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Okay, so that's where Beersheba is. You can see the Dead Sea. You can see where the Gaza Strip is. Even at this, uh, in this day and age, they're always shooting at Beersheba from the Gaza Strip. Hamas is. But if you kind of take a look at that and you see where the Dead Sea is as well. Okay, here is the wilderness of Paran. It's further south. Here's the Red Sea or the Reed Sea. Uh, so this is the wilderness of Paran. Down here is a lot. Okay, we're going to be going by a lot on our trip and going over into Jordan. But this is the southern part of Israel in a lot. Here's Timnah. This is where Moses' tabernacle replica is that we're going to be seeing next month. But I want you to get an idea that this is the wilderness of Paran. So that's where he went. And next door is Egypt. Okay, and so she took him a wife out of Egypt. So let's look at Genesis 21, 27 through 34. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. He's the Philistine that's over in the Gaza Strip area. And then both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And then Abimelech says to Abraham, What do these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves mean? And he said, It's for these seven ewe lambs shall you take of my hand that they may be a witness to me that I'm the one who dug this well, wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because they swear both of them, and they made a covenant at Beersheba, and then Abimelech got up with Phicol, uh, the chief captain, and they returned back to the land of the Philistines, and then Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days." All right, so this is the area, and I've been to Beersheba. I've seen the, one of the wells of Abraham there, uh, archaeological site. It's very cool. But now, look at Genesis 22.1. It says, now, well, first let me say this. I think it's fascinating that on Rosh Hashanah, we read about a miracle birth, the miraculous birth of Isaac. Okay, and then let's look at Genesis 22.1. After these things, God put Abraham to the test, and he said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And he said to him, I want you to take your son, your dearly loved only son, Isaac. Go to the land of Moriah and give him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will give you knowledge of. Why is that one of the readings today? Because it happened today. This is the day. That's why this is one of the readings to remind us this happened today. <clears throat> it happened on Rosh Hashanah. Now look at Genesis 22, 4 and 5. <clears throat> on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place a long way off. And he said to his young men, keep here with the donkey and I and the boy. The little boy. We're going to go on and give worship and come back again to you. How many of you have seen pictures of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. And how old does Isaac look in those pictures? 10, something like that. And who knows how old Isaac really was? 37. Isaac was 37. Okay. How old is Abraham if Isaac's 37? 137. You don't think Isaac couldn't have ran away? You don't think he couldn't have overpowered him? This shows you that Isaac was willing to die as a type of the Messiah, which is quite amazing. And so in Genesis 22:14, there was a ram caught in the thicket, which is why the ram's horn is blown on this day. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Yireh. Now, there's no J's in Hebrew, uh, there's no J's in Greek, and there never were any J's even in English until about the 1600s. Uh, they have Jehazer in this translation, but it's Yehovah Yireh, uh, and it says, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Well, guess what? It was at Mount Moriah that uh, everything was seen. This is where the temple is built. This is where God's presence was. Now, I find it interesting that 
the place was called Yehovah Yireh. When David conquered Jerusalem, who had owned it? The Jebusites. Okay. Ornan, the Jebusite, is who he brought, uh, bought the threshing floor from. Okay. So when David took it over and he was going to give it its new name, that city, he goes, wow, let me think about it. King, who was the king over that place earlier? Melchizedek. Melchizedek was called the king of Salem. And that was the name of the town. And so David goes, gee, do I honor Melchizedek and call it Salem? Or do I honor Abraham and call it Yireh? I'll call it Yerusalem. And that's where the name Jerusalem came from. That is exactly, he wanted to honor both Melchizedek and Abraham. All right. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. What time it is? Okay, Jeremiah. I think this is interesting that these verses are also read on Rosh Hashanah. Now, again, I mentioned this last night, but for those who weren't here last night, I think it's interesting that today, Rosh Hashanah, the new moon, is when humanity was created. Adam was born. But out of all of humanity, God picks Israel as his firstborn son. And that is why this is the first day of the civil calendar. But Nisan 1 is the first day of the religious calendar because it's honoring the birth of the nation of Israel. So there's two calendars because there are two big beginnings that happened on those. Now in Jeremiah 31, 3 through 7, it says, The Lord has appeared to me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you will be built, O virgin of Israel. You will again be adorned with your tabrets. You'll go forth in the dances of them that make merry. You shall plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters will plant, and they will eat them as common things, for there shall be a day that the watchmen upon Mount Ephraim will cry. Now, do you know what the Hebrew word for watchman is? There are different words, but in this one, it's notzrim, which they translate today as Christians. They follow the Nazarite. Okay, so here it says there will be Christians that will be the watchmen on Mount Ephraim. And they're going to say, let's go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Well, isn't that interesting? And here you have Hayovel having all these volunteers on the mountains of Samaria, picking the grapes for the farmers, volunteering to do that. This is a prophecy that's being fulfilled right now. And, of course, we're going to be up there too next month. And it says, they're going to cry out, Arise, let's go up to Zion. For thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob. Shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Now, you have to remember what was going on in Jeremiah's day when he was writing this. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar's destroying it. They burnt the temple down. They're all in exile. And so what does God do? He assures Jeremiah, hey, you're coming back. It's going to be okay. Go ahead. Buy this plot of land from your uncle. All right? It's all going to be good. And so we also have to remember, even though we're going through troublous times, you know, sometimes ourselves, remember, it came to pass. <laughs> it's going to go away. And then hopefully we grow out of it. Well, what is also read today is 1 Samuel 1.1. 1, 1. There was a certain man of a crazy place of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. Remember Elkanah? It says in verse 3 that this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. Where? That is where the tabernacle was for 368 years. This is where Samuel was. This is where Hophni and Phinehas was Eli, and we're going to visit that place too next month. And it says that uh, the two sons, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, 
where the priests of the Lord, they were there. As a matter of fact, you can see kind of like an underground cave where Eli lived when we go there. And now look at 1 Samuel 120. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, she bare a son and called his name what? Samuel. Which basically means what? Samuel, think of Shema, hear and obey. El is God. Okay, because Hannah was heard from God. God heard her prayer and answered it, so she named him Samuel. Because I have what? Asked him of the Lord. It always tells you basically what the word means when you read the sentence after it. Well, guess what? Here, this day, we have another story of the miraculous birth of a son. Another miraculous birth. Now, here's something else. Who remembers? Was Samuel a priest? He was not a priest. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, but he became a priest. Well, how does someone who was not from the line of Aaron become a priest? Uh, because I mean, the, all the Levites were not priests. Only like 1% of the Levites were priests. That was the sons of Aaron. And he wasn't from the tribe of Benjamin. He was from the tribe of Levi. But he wasn't a son of Aaron, so he couldn't be a priest. But he was from the tribe of Levi. Does anyone remember who his great, 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 great grandfather was? Okay. If you remember... Levi had three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Kohath had, who? Remember? Okay. Amram was one of them who was the father of Moses. And who was Moses' first cousin? Korah. The whole rebellion of Korah, he was upset because he wanted to be a priest. And this Levite could not be a priest because he wasn't a son of Aaron, although he was a Levite. And so remember, the ground opened up and swallowed Korah. Well, guess what? His wife and family deserted Korah, wanted nothing to do with his rebellion. They survived. And Samuel was one of the sons of Korah that survived. And they could not have the priesthood, but God blesses Samuel, who was a son of Levi, but not a son of Aaron. And he was actually related directly to Kor, uh, you know, Korah. Isn't that fascinating? That's another miracle. Okay. <clears throat> First Samuel 1, 25 through 27. They slew a bull. They brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul is, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child. I prayed and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So here she is, you know, praying for a child. Do you know what? Oh, I think it was about four or five years ago. My sister and my niece went with us on the Israel tour. We went to Shiloh. And she was married, but she couldn't get pregnant. So we prayed for her that at Shiloh. And the next year, she got pregnant. <laughs> Another miracle. Okay, 1 Samuel 2, 2-3. It says, There was none as holy as the Lord, for there is none beside you. Neither is any rock like our God. And then this is Hannah's thank you to the Lord. And she says, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him all of our actions are weighed. Remember, Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, God is weighing all of our actions. First Samuel 2, 6 and 7, it says, The Lord is the one who kills, but the Lord is also the one who resurrects. He brings down to the grave, but guess what? He brings up out of the grave. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. This is all speaking about Yom Teruah. Isn't that fascinating? Now let's go. Let me see how much more I got. Okay, we're going to hurry. Now look at Luke 1, 38 through 40. Here, 
Miriam says, I'm a servant of the Lord. May it be to me as you say. And the angel went away. Then Mary got up and went quickly to the highlands, to a town of Judah, and went into the house of Zacharias and took Elizabeth in her arms. We're about to hear the, another story of the miraculous birth of another son. I think it's fascinating that we're hearing all about these miraculous births today. And then in Matthew 24, 30 through 31, it says, concerning coming back, then the sign of, of the Son of Man will be seen in heaven, and all nations of the earth will have sorrow, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a great sound of a horn, and they will get his saints together from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is the Takiyah Hakadol on Rosh Hashanah, when all the saints are going to be gathered together. As a matter of fact, let's go back to uh, Yom Teruah, Leviticus 23, 23. The Lord tells Moses to tell the children of Israel, it is in the seventh month, the first day of the month, you're to have a Sabbath. And I think it's fascinating. Rosh Hashanah falls on a Sabbath. It's kind of like a double Sabbath. And it's a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, a holy assembly, which is, again, the blowing of the shofar, remembering the memorial is remembering Isaac. Numbers 29 1 says the same thing. In the seventh month, the first day of the month, you're to have a holy convocation or a holy dress rehearsal. And you to do no servile work. It is a day of Yom Teruah. That's what it is a day of. The word for blowing there is Teruah. And day is Yom. So Yom Teruah is the day of blowing. This is where this day's name biblically comes from. A lot of people say, well, it's not in the Bible. You know, yes, it is. It's right there. Matthew 2, 23. And what do we see? Yeshua came and he dwelt in a city called what? Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He will be called what? A Nazarene. Look at Isaiah 11, 1. Where, where is this prophecy that's talking about in the New Testament? There will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a what? And the Hebrew word is netzer, which is where you get Nazarene. Nazareth means branch town. Okay, that was the name of it, branch town. And it says, uh, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. So that branch refers to the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, can uh, any Christians ever argue over doctrine? <laughs> you think of any? Well, think about this. Back then, they were all looking for the Messiah. And they're all looking at the same Bible. And they're looking for the Messiah to come out of Nazareth because he's supposed to be called a Nazarene. But can anything good come out of Nazareth? So they're confused. Well, look at the next one in Matthew 2, 14 and 15. When he arose, he took the young child. This is his father, Joseph, and his mom, Miriam. And his mother, by night, departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. So they have the first church of Egypt and the first church of Nazareth, and they're all arguing. Does he come out of Egypt? Is he a, you know, who, who is this guy? Well, look where this prophecy comes from. Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. So they're all having this argument. Is he a Nazarene from Nazareth? Is he an Egyptian? Well, look at Deuteronomy 18.15. It says, The Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from your midst, like unto me, unto whom you shall hearken. So they go, okay, this has to be the Messiah. So the Messiah is also supposed to be the, a prophet, like Moses. Well, now look what happens. In John 7, 40 through 43, many of the people, therefore, when they heard the saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Another said, no, it's not the prophet. This is the Messiah. So they were confused. Uh, is it supposed to be the same person or two different offices? But some said, no, shall a Messiah come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Messiah comes from the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people. Oh my goodness, is he, the Messiah is supposed to come out of Nazareth? No, he comes out of Bethlehem. No, he comes out of Egypt. So you have three different denominations arguing, who is it supposed to be? Well, look at Micah 5 too. 
But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth to me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting, proving that the Messiah is also divine. And then look at Matthew 2, 4 through 6. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Messiah should be born. Herod did. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it's written by the prophet, and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of you will come a governor that will rule my people Israel. Wow. Can you imagine? They were all right. They were all right. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think that's fascinating because here you have these three people all looking out of one lens. They're laser focused that they're not open to other opinions. So none of them know. Well, guess what? I believe the same thing's happening today. The problem with the Christian Gentile thinking is always, I'm right, you're wrong. And they go, no, I'm right, you're wrong. And they're all looking at the same scriptures, but they're not looking at the big picture. Maybe... All three could be true. We got to get out of the box. Christians have to get out of the theological box. Then they'll understand the Hebraic mindset better. But get a load of this. Could it be true also that there will be more than one harvest or more than one taking out? What? We already know there's two taking outs because one of them is the tares and then the wheat and the tares are to go before the wheat in this situation. Now, personally, uh, I don't have that parable here, but he says, take the tares first and burn them. And the last judgment is by fire. And then he says, gather the wheat and put them in, or take them to my barn. Where is God's barn? The threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. It's the Temple Mount. It was a threshing floor. That's where God's barn is. Where are the tares going? I believe, now how many of you know in Zechariah 14, there's a whole lot of human sinners that survived the tribulation that entered the millennial reign just like we are now. Did you know that? There's going to be a lot of Christians and non-Christians or whoever that survived the tribulation and they still are in this body of flesh when many others will have the new body that Messiah had. At the same time, talk about living among aliens. It's going to be really different. <laughs> but here's the thing. I want you to think about this. In... Oh, let me finish this. So anyway, there, were, there in Revelation, it talks about two different grape harvests. Okay, Passover is what harvest? Barley. Pentecost, the summer, is what crop? Wheat. And in the fall, what crop? More than that, it's the fruit harvest. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 8.8 8 talks about what's called the seven species. It's a land of wheat and barley. That's Shavuot and Passover. And then in the seventh month, you have grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. So there's all kinds of things that need to be harvested. It's not just the grapes. But I think it's fascinating that there are two harvests of grape. And we know when you study the grape harvest, the white wine comes first and then comes the red wine. All right, and then finally, there's the ice wine. So this tells you that the figs, they're harvested June through December, the dates July through October, the pomegranates August and October, grapes August through November, and olives October through November, and then, of course, through December, which is when the ice wine is also taken. So there are different fruits being harvested over a time period. And so what I think is interesting concerning the grapes, listen to what this says. It says to ensure the highest quality of grapes, the Israeli winemakers use a variety of techniques during the harvest season. One of the most important of these is hand picking. Just like the angels will hand pick the best grapes. 
and leave the grapes that aren't ready to go stay on the branch until they mature. Isn't that fascinating when you see the angels, the two harvests, first it's the Messiah on the cloud who's picking the best quality of the grapes. And then the second angel is picking the next quality of the grapes. Just something to be thinking about that may be like, I think we already see a not Saul of both the wicked and the righteous. So what I was saying is this, in Zechariah 14, we know there will be humans who survive, but maybe they are the nominal people or that maybe they never really had a chance. And so I believe there will be a rapture of the very wicked, evil people. They'll be raptured to the battle of Armageddon. That's where they're going to be found. And then we will be taken to the battle of Armageddon and come on the horses in the white clothes and destroy all of the most wicked. So God is going to rapture the wicked as well as the righteous. But they get to go to the battle of Armageddon and they're going to find themselves all of a sudden planted there. And we'll be taken and then that's when the battle takes place. But also concerning the righteous, I believe there will be several taking outs. There could be one at the beginning. There could be one in the middle. There could be one at the end. And so everyone's arguing, when is it going to take place? You're all right. Again, it's the same thing. There could be first the white, which is the righteousness of the saints and the white garments and the white wine. And then there are some that may go through the middle. And they'd be like the red wine or those grapes. And then finally at the end will be the ice wine. So all I'm saying is so many people argue so much and they fight among themselves about which is right, get out of the box. Get out of the box and, and realize, well, hey, let's take another look at this. Maybe everyone's right. Isn't that fascinating? Well, we got to go. So let's stand. And then we're going to come back and talk about replacement theology and how it's affected our biblical thinking. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, I just thank you so much that there are so many here this particular weekend that are honoring you, that are setting apart this day as a double Sabbath. It's not only the seventh day of the week. It's also the first day of the year, the first day of the new month. It's so many things. And I just thank you for all of those people here locally, around the United States, around the world, Father, that want to be a part of all of this that's going on. They want to be a light to the nations. Father, I just thank you for them. And, and Father, even though this is the, the weekend of first fruits as far as the, the fall harvest begins, and we just thank you so much for all of those who want to set apart a, one out of the 10 blessings that you've given them, and they just want to take a part to honor you and recognize you as their benefactor. Father, we thank you for any tithes and offerings that do come in uh, locally or online. Father, because we want to be that light to the nations. We just love you, Lord. And I just pray right now, Father, that you would touch hearts, touch lives, bring everyone closer to you so that your bright light that is shining through each and every one of us will be a brighter light than ever before. In Yeshua's name, amen. Uh, before we say the blessing, there's one thing I think I forgot to mention. Oh, no, I, I did mention this. But uh, I just want to, again, thank the nations around the world that participated. There were two people in Argentina, two in Australia, one in Canada, four in Germany, four in the United Kingdom, and 38 in South Africa. Wow. Amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us a life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. I only have today and next Shabbat, and then I'm done with the replacement theology teaching.
I'm going to be teaching today how replacement theology has affected the Feast of Tabernacles. And then next week is going to be one of your favorite. I'm going to teach about replacement theology, where the Shabbat was changed to Sunday. And so a lot of you will be able to have <clears throat> some real good biblical proof of why the Shabbat is on the Shabbat. Okay, so right now, as we have here, replacement theology has turned Yeshua from this and to this. Ah, it's right. And then they, Christians wonder, well, why don't the Jews recognize him? I mean, first off, he's got a bad case of arthritis, as you can see. Now, I don't know how many of you were here when I talked about this, but of course, the early Catholics like this kind of a painting. That's what it comes from. It was interesting. How many of you were at the Rosh Hashanah service last night at Urban Grace Church uh, in that back area where we had the, the little store where you could get stuff there? They had these kind of pictures all over the place. It was hilarious. But anyway, that little hand thing that he has there, the Catholics wanted to incorporate all of paganism so everyone would feel like a Catholic, which means universal. But that hand signal there, or the hand sign, comes from both the Hare Krishnas and the Buddhists. Uh, there's like a billion people from Hare Krishna and about 500 million Buddhists. Well, that came, uh, the Hindus from 2000 BC that started, and with the Buddhists around 500 BC that was used. And so <clears throat> we see here that this is uh, supposed to be Jesus, and, and there's no J's in Hebrew. There's no J's in Greek. There's not even a J in English until the 1600s. Uh, but this is what replacement theology has done. Well, what else has it done? It's turned the birthday of Messiah, which is on the Feast of Tabernacles in October, into Christmas. Okay, and, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the birth of the Messiah, King Messiah. So let's start here in the little town of Bethlehem. Well, guess, or how many of you have heard of Bethlehem? How many of you know the Hebrew word for Bethlehem? Beit Lechem. And what does Beit Lechem mean? House of bread. Bait is house. We know from the letter bait. Lechem is bread. Imagine that. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. What a coincidence. But we're going to talk about the birth of King Messiah and the way we actually can figure it out. I, I was raised a Catholic, which is why I can be hard on Catholics. I was Catholic for about 19 years. Uh, studied to be a priest. But... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> God never heard that. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I went to an all-male high school. I left home at 13 years old. And uh, I lived at the school. It was like a dorm, you know, that type of school. And so I was there for four years. I was about 200 miles from home, so I never could go home except during the summer and as a 13-year-old, all of a sudden leaving home, it's uh, kind of traumatic for at least the first couple of weeks. And then, I, yay! But, uh, yeah, it was a high school prep seminary to study to be a priest as uh, what I did. And then after I graduated from high school, I said, forget this, I want to get married. <laughs> so I, I went to a Catholic college for a year. Uh, and then uh, I really felt like, no, the Lord wants me in the ministry. So uh, I was very familiar with monasteries and monks back then, too. So I thought I wanted to be a Trappist monk and go to Gethsemane, Kentucky. Can you imagine me never talking? <laughs> 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 I'd have failed bad. But uh, so what was fascinating... They said, okay, you're going to a year at college. I want you to go at least two years. Go one more year, and, and then we'd love to have you here in Gethsemane. I said, great. Well, that summer I got saved. And uh, so the Lord called me into a ministry, but it wasn't into the priesthood. 
But I had, I don't know if I've ever told you this one story I had, when, uh, why I felt God called me to the priesthood. Do you guys got a second? It's amazing. I should have my, I have a little PowerPoint I made to go over this, but I'll just tell you. I grew up in a small town of 800 people. How many of you know, in a town of 800 people, everybody knows? Everybody. Not only that, these were good Catholic families. Some of them had 18 kids. Okay? The reason they had 18 kids, they were farms. They want free labor. It's always about the money. Okay? No. We couldn't be a farmer because my dad was crippled. He became a tax accountant for the farmers. But uh, in this small town, everybody, especially if you're in high school, you know, grade school, er, er, you know all the kids in the whole neighborhood. Everybody knows everybody. And I was the, I had five older sisters, two older brothers, and a younger brother. So nine kids in the family. And... uh, Imagine this, my mom and dad were 30 years old and already had nine kids under the age of 13. It's a good Catholic family. Can you imagine being 30 years old and having nine kids under the age of 13? Could mom get a job? No, she had a full-time job. Okay, my younger brother, who's a year younger than me, was a newborn, and I was like 18 months. I mean, she had like three kids in diapers at the same time, half the time. It was just insane. But anyway, my dad is in the old VW van back in 57. Uh, You know, those VW vans with no front, you know. And they didn't have seatbelts then. And he's going about 60 miles an hour uh, at night, about 10 o'clock at night, because they didn't really have speed limits back then either. And a drunk had a vehicle in the lane, but... He wasn't there. He ran out of gas and just left his truck on the highway. So my dad in his VW van at 10 at night going 60, 70 miles an hour plows right into the back of this truck. And you're in a van. You're just standing up and there's nothing in front of you but a piece of metal. There's, there is no engine. And so he plows into the back of that. <clears throat> and his right leg, which is stomping on the brake, okay, his femur was completely shattered and gone. His hip was completely shattered and gone. And uh, he was, uh, his head kind of went through the roof, his foot through the floorboard, and he was in a full body cast for three years. Medicine isn't like it is today, but can you imagine, 30 years old in a full body cast for three years, and mom, who has a husband in a full body cast, has nine kids to take care of too. No income. The guy had no insurance. Dad can't work. Mom can't work. Us kids can't work. We're all under 13 years of old, so we had absolutely no income. Talk about poor. We used to joke, yeah, look up at the dictionary, the word poor, and say, see, the Bills family. But um, because after my dad got out of the hospital, no one wanted to hire a cripple back then. And he would try everything. He he tried uh, real estate, uh, but in our small Catholic German town, he sold a house to a black person, and they said, no way, and they booted him out. And then he sold it to a Jewish person, and they said, no way, and they booted him out. And so my dad says, good grief, what can I do? You know, so he's trying to find a job, and he ended up being a tax accountant. But uh, because mom and dad couldn't work, we, and because I'm only a year and a half, I don't know anything different. But the way we survived for about four years is people would just simply bring boxes of stuff to our house. That's how we lived. When my sister was in fifth grade, she had to wear boys' dress shoes because that's all that was in the box. You know, so we lived out of boxes for several years, but I thought everybody had boxes delivered to their house. I'm just, you know, I don't want any different. But uh, my dad, who's lost his femur, had to have a metal rod attached to his hip side. Uh, And so he had to decide if that metal rod was going to be fused straight down and he could never sit or straight out and he could never stand. And so he decided he wanted to stand. So they fused it straight down and his knee can't bend either. So he's got this locked leg completely and it was two inches shorter than his other leg. And so he had to pay for a built up shoe all the time. Well, when They got better science. They could put an artificial hip in, and he could at least swing his leg then, you know, so it wasn't rigid. And when they were doing that, he asked them if they could lengthen that bad leg to get rid of the built-up shoe. The doctor said, no, but we can cut your good leg off and shorten it two inches. He goes, let's do that. 
So they go in, they slice open his thigh, they cut out two inches of bone, they put the bones together with metal brackets and nuts and bolts to hold together, and sew them back up. A couple months later, he falls and breaks it. They got to reopen it again, reset everything, sew them back up. And then a year later, they reopen them again and take all the brackets and the nuts and the bolts out and put them back together. So at least now he can swing his hip and also not have the built up shoe. So anyway, so he was just a lot of pain his whole life, you know. Well, at, we basically, uh, and both my parents are in heaven, whatever, they're gone. But I was... Uh, felt because we never could get much attention and because I'm the second youngest I really felt like nobody loved me and I was going to go eat worms you know <clears throat> so I'm in eighth grade and of course I'm going to run away and I write this note and stick it on my bed where they can find it nobody loves me I'm running away and so I go run away about four blocks from us is a big wooded area with a creek and the train tracks go by it, and the highway goes by it, and it's about 10 o'clock at night. My mom was gone to some retreat for the weekend. Just my dad was home with my brother, who's a year younger, in seventh grade, and my sister, who's two years older in high school. Everyone else has already grown and gone, so we're the only three of the house, and my dad. And so uh, I run away, but I leave the note. So, of course, my sister and other brother calling for me. 10 o'clock at night, they're trying to find me. You know, and I have my backpack and my sleeping bag, and I'm laying uh, out by the train tracks to get. I was going to be like those old hobos, and uh, I've never heard that term. But I was going to jump on the next train as it went by and get the heck out of here. So there, you always know if you're going to run away, you're going to go to the creek. Uh, and so I hear my brother and my sister's voice, and they're calling for me to tell us where you are. And I'm laying down with my head on a pillow, and all of a sudden I hear audibly, like the police had these big megaphones. It was like that loud. And it was my dad's voice saying, Mark, tell the kids where you are. And I start just crying out to God, God, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to run away? Am I supposed to go home? And I hear my brother and sister calling, and I, I, I'm crying out to God, and I hear this loud, booming voice again, which sounded like my dad, saying, Mark, tell the kids where you are. So finally, I tell them where I am, and they come running over, and I ask them if they had heard that voice, and was I in trouble with dad? Did he get the police, and I'm going to have to get put in juvie hall or something, you know? But my dad's crippled. And they said, no, dad's at home. He hasn't gone anywhere. We're the only two that are looking for you. And I go, well, did you hear that loud voice? No, we didn't hear a thing. And then out of nowhere comes a young man out of the wooded area right up to us. None of us had ever seen him before. None of us knew who he was. And none of us ever saw him again. And he said, can I be of any help? And my sister said, well, my Bro little brother's run away, but he's decided he's going to come home. And this live gentleman we all saw said, good, home is where he belongs. And he took off at 10 o'clock at night uh, in the woods. Nobody, and so, you know, I really felt like uh, God was calling me to be in the ministry because of that. But I thought it was to be a priest, you know. And so that's why I joined uh, the priesthood. Uh, but then... But anyway, I've had a, a couple of things like that happen where I've literally seen things, heard things. Now, I can't say definitely what these things were, but uh, that's what keeps me motivated and going. Okay, but back to this. In Luke 1 through 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, what kind of a priest? A certain priest, his name was Zechariah, and he was of the priestly division of Abiyah, which means of father, Yah, God. My father is God. That's his name. He had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheva or Elizabeth. Well, guess what? Aaron also married a woman named Elizabeth, in case you didn't know, way back in the day. But when it says the priestly division of Abijah, what does that tell us? Well, if you know your Bible, 
If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24 and you look at verse 7 through 18, it lists the division of the 24 courses of priests and who was in charge of each course. And what do we find? The eighth course was given to Abijah and the ninth course happened to go to Yeshua, which I thought was kind of interesting. But the eighth course is the course of Abijah. So can we, that's what it just says right there. So can we determine when this was happening? <clears throat> Look at Luke 1, 8 and 9. It happened while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Okay, he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division or course, according to the custom of the priest's office, and he got the lot to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And look what 1 Chronicles 24 says. These are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Itamar. Nadab and Abihu died before the father, had no children. Therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. And we see in 1 Chronicles 24.10, the seventh went to Hakos, and the eighth went to who? Abijah. And in 24.19, these were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron their father as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. Okay, so everything was done unto the course from 1,500 years earlier was Moses. A 1,000 years earlier was David. David is the one who ordered these courses, and they have been kept for a 1,000 years at the time of Yeshua. Now, the interesting thing, what most Christians aren't aware of, where it says his lot was to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense, that refers to a lottery, a lottery. There were hundreds of thousands of priests and the incense was burned three times a day, okay? Or the morning and the evening, uh, let's say twice a day. Morning and evening, they had to burn the incense. Well, you take twice a day times 365, you have roughly 700. But there's like 100,000 priests. They all want to be the one to burn the incense. And some, you only, when you did get to burn the incense, you only got to do it once in your entire life. You, you were taken out of the lottery. Because, you know, it, it would take you know, 100 years with all the priests to be able to do the, burn the incense. So here he is, and you know he's been wanting to burn incense. He's been playing the lottery of the burning of the incense. But see, they also had a lottery every day. Who was going to take uh, the sacrifices up to the altar? Who won the lottery to be the one to do the sacrifice? Who won the lottery to be the one to uh, take the ashes out? Every function of the priesthood was all done by a lottery. And so every day, because it's like being on a basketball team and sitting on the bench your whole life. Okay, so it's like they want to be in the game. So they were all praying that they could win the lottery, especially the incense, because then you got to go right up to the Holy of Holies. I mean, that was the number one thing. And here he probably feels like God didn't love him because he's old. He's, he's ready to retire and he hasn't done it. And many of us sometimes feel like, man, our time has expired. But no, God is waiting for the perfect time just for you to answer your prayer. He's all about timing. And so how the courses went, when is the beginning of the religious cycle? Nisan 1. So to make this simple, Nisan is roughly our April. So look at uh, on your notes at Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. It says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover, at the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, or Shavuot, and at the Feast of Booths, or tabernacles. So everyone has to be there three times a year. Even if you were a Jew in another country or whatever, that's why in Acts there were Jews from all these nations because they all had to be there for Shavuot. Okay, so the, what they would do, there's 24 courses. What's 24 times 2? 48. And then you have three weeks for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles where all 24 courses would minister at one time. The reason why is, Jeru uh, for example, Josephus says in Jerusalem, there were two million people there for Passover. So they would need all hands on deck and all the priests would minister. So here we have the first course is going to be the first week of Nisan. The second course is going to be the second week. But guess what? 
Passover is the next week, so the people that served the second week also had to serve the third week because it's all hands on deck. And it's the same thing with the third course. The third course also had to serve during that uh, week as well as the third course. So some of them have to serve twice, two weeks in a row, based on if it's around a holiday. But typically, they would serve a week, and then six months later, they'd serve a week. Okay, that's how they would do their courses. So now, the, what comes after the third course? It's not hard. The fourth course. The fifth course. The sixth course. The seventh course. That takes you through the month of May. All right. And this is the counting of the Omer is what is going on. Because from Passover to uh, Shavuot or Pentecost, they have the counting of the Omer. So after the seventh course, what course comes? Good. The eighth course, but what happens if you're serving the eighth course? Now comes Shavuot, Pentecost, and everybody has to serve the eighth course. And then comes the ninth course. Is everyone following me? Okay, so here, Zechariah is serving his course. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you're going to have a kid. And he says, well, I got to get home then. But he can't go home for another week. He's got to serve the whole week of Shava out. And then he goes home. So here he is, serves the eighth course, and he serves that whole week. All right? And then everyone is there for Shava out. It is a crowd. So here, can you imagine, again, a million people there. All right? And so every single course is serving. Well, let's look at this now. Let's go back to our notes. Look at Luke 1, 10 and 11. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Because he's doing the incense. I think the Greek word for multitude here is plethora. What does that mean? A lot. Why? Because it was Shavuot. When you understand the Hebraic mindset and you haven't replaced it with Christianity, you, and you know the courses, you know he's serving Shavuot. He had to, doesn't it make sense for the Lord to come down on Shavuot, which is what he did back in the Exodus? He came down on Shavuot. And now, look at Deuteronomy um, yeah, 1616, again, three times everyone has to appear. That's why the place is packed at unleavened bread. It's packed at the Feast of Weeks, and it's packed at, packed at the Feast of Booths. And then it says in Luke 1, through 24, it happened when the days of his service were fulfilled, he departed to his house, and after these days, not months or years, but days, Elisheva, his wife, conceived, and she hid herself how many months? Okay, so here we are, and he has to serve the second course, and uh, then what do we see happens? He goes home with Elisheva and says, let's have a kid. Now, so Yochanan is conceived here, or John, I say Yochanan because that's his real name, and anybody know what Yochanan means? Okay, let me help you. What is Canaan? Grace, mercy. Yochanan is God's mercy, God's grace. But when you say John, you don't get that. That's why you want to keep the Hebrew, so then you know, uh, know it means God's grace and mercy. Okay, so then this would be the ninth course, the tenth course, the eleventh course. Now, she hid herself for five months, right? So if that was the middle of June, July, August, September, October, that's to the middle of November. She hid herself. Okay, and now she's kind of showing and can't really hide anything. So then what happens, look at this next verse in Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, well, let's look here. If the fifth month is November, when is the sixth month? December. And here we have Hanukkah. The festival of lights. This is when Noah's rainbow first appeared. Also, 
And this Messiah was conceived at Hanukkah. Because what do we see here? It says... In Luke 1, 35 and 36, the angel answers Miriam and says, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. Behold, Elisheba, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is what month? With her who was called barren. We have another miraculous birth, just like we did earlier. Okay? With Isaac, with Samuel. Here we're hearing about another miraculous birth. And this is the sixth month, which means it's in the middle of December that Messiah is conceived. Look at Luke 1.56. Miriam stayed with her about three months and then returned to her house. Why did she stay three months? What's six months plus three months? How long does it take to have a baby? So she stays until John is born and he's born at Passover. And a lot of the Jews today believe Elijah comes at Passover. And John was a type of Elijah. Remember? And he appeared at Passover. That's when he was born. Okay. Now, if it's the sixth month for Yochanan in December, and late December is when Miriam conceives. Okay, here you have that cup of Elijah when he is born. But if you are in the end of December and you add nine months, what does that take you to? The end of September, which is when Sukkot is. Do you see how easy it is to determine Messiah was not born in the middle of winter on the December 25th. He was born on Sukkot. Now, there are Messianic leaders and other people that say, think he was born on Passover, you're going to see that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I will prove to you why. Uh, no reflection on the teachers, but it's, uh, it's just so dumb. Okay, let's, let's, let's look. Let's look at what we got here. Okay. It says in Luke 2, 7. 6 and 7. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What happens on Sukkot? You got 2 million people there from all over, which is why there's no hotel rooms available. There would be all kinds of room if it was in the middle of winter. How many of you go to Alaska for vacation in the middle of winter? How many of you go to Hawaii in the middle of winter? Okay. And you go to Alaska in the middle of summer. It is stupid to think he's born in December and the inn not be, or the inn's full. No one goes there. Okay, so the very fact that there is no room in the inn proves you it was on one of the holidays, Passover, Pentecost, or Tabernacles. But we already know from the 24 courses, it had to be, okay, on Sukkot that he was born. Now, I don't know if you know about the swaddling clothes. Basically, it, the manger was a sukkah. All of the Jews have to be in a sukkah for the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, that's what has to happen. As a matter of fact, look at this. In Jerusalem, look at all these sukkahs in a truck. They're all moving these sukkahs. Either they're living out of the sukkah in the truck or they're selling them somewhere. They even have sukkahs on camels that you can be in. Okay, everybody is in a sukkah. That's what a booth, something like that. Now, about the swaddling clothes. If you remember, the linen garments of the priests, they all wore white linen garments, and they would never wash their clothes. And when their garments were so stained by the sacrifices, the blood all over it, then they would take those priestly garments that were stained with the blood of the animals for our sins, they would literally cut them into strips and they would be used for wicks for the big temple candles. 
Okay, they would, that, that would become the wick. But they would also take, the, all, they were like giant baskets in the women's court, and the women would take those strips home and use them to wrap their babies in. So the swaddling clothes that Jesus was wrapped in was the priestly garments that had been stained with their sins, the blood. That was the swaddling clothes. Here he's a priest wrapped in priestly garments stained from the blood of the sacrifices. When, yeah. Now, but wait, there's more. Look at Exodus 15 verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my what? Yeshua. He's become my Yeshua, and the voice of rejoicing and Yeshua is where? In the tabernacles of the righteous. Wow. So here we go. Here's the tabernacles, and Yeshua is now in the tabernacles of the righteous. This is Psalm 118, which is sung Every Sukkot for the last 3,000 years, they sing this Psalm 118. And so what happens? Yeshua is being born, and Joseph and Miriam are hearing, and they're singing, Wow! The Lord is my strength and my song, and the Lord has become my Yeshua. He's my God, and I'm going to prepare a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. And here this habitation is prepared. It's the Sukkah. Now look at Psalm 118, verse 24 and 25. It says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will what? Why? Because God commanded them to rejoice. Can you imagine? God says for eight days, I don't want to hear no whiny whinies. You are going to rejoice for eight days. Why? Because he knew during the Feast of Tabernacles when my Messiah would be born. Can you imagine? The surprise birthday party wasn't for Yeshua, it was for all of Israel. What a big surprise. Yeshua is born. They don't even realize it. And they're seeing Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous. And they don't even know that Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds. Oh, let me show you this picture first here too. Everyone's commanded to rejoice. So they have these big rejoicing parties celebrating Messiah's birth and they don't even realize it's his birthday. Look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds in the same country staying in the field. Where were they? Stay. They weren't just in the field. They were staying in the field and they were keeping watch by night over their flock and behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. And the angel said, don't be terrified. Behold, I bring you good news of what? Which is why he commanded them to rejoice, because someday in the future, there's going to be great joy because the Messiah is born. And they say, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. You are not commanded to rejoice during Passover. You are commanded to rejoice during Sukkot because that's when the Messiah is going to be born. Now, here we have the sheep and the shepherds are where? Staying in the field. If this happened around Christmas in Israel, you have freezing rain. I mean, it is cold. That's why we don't do tours in December and January and February because it's going to be Cold rain. The shepherds don't stay in the fields in the middle of December. All the sheep are put in their pens. Now, as a matter of fact, if you remember, they were in Nazareth and they went down to Bethlehem. Well, do you, and Bethlehem is just a couple miles from Jerusalem. But can you imagine? It is 40 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They didn't have cars back then. Okay, that's important uh, to realize. Would it be kind of the Father in heaven to have Miriam, who was over nine months pregnant, riding a camel 40 miles in the freezing rain and snow? Not going to happen. But what happens, 
the Feast of Tabernacles, they have huge caravans and multitudes and thousands are going to the temple. And so she just joins them in a, a nice wagon and they're all going together as a group. It's not like her and Joseph are alone riding a donkey or a camel or a horse. That would not be kind. As a matter of fact, here is a picture of Jerusalem in the winter. Here you go. Take a look at that. Okay, so God is not going to have Miriam in the middle of winter ride a camel or whatever when she's over nine months pregnant, bouncing up and down on a stupid camel or horse. That's just not the way God works. Okay, so that's, again, another proof that didn't happen at Christmas. Look at John 1, 14. The word was made flesh, and what did he do? Oh, amazing, he tabernacled during the Feast of Tabernacles. What a concept. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see what happened. The word became flesh in John 1, and he dwelt among us, which also is he tabernacled among us. And then look at Luke 2, 13. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can you imagine? Here they're up in heaven. I have night lights over in the Middle East. There's not too many lights. But back then, there was like no lights except over Jerusalem with the lights of the temple menorahs that were there. And the angels, you know, they're saying... Glory to God in the highest and on earth good will toward men. This never would have happened at Passover. This never would have happened at Christmas. This would only have happened during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, here's what is incredible. I want you to think about this. Look at Luke 2, 21. When the eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called what? And when do they give children their names? On the eighth day. And most people don't make this connection. He's circumcised on the eighth day, which is the day he gets his name, and he is named Yeshua, which means what? Phation. This was given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. So what is happening? Think about this. He's being circumcised on the eighth day. If he was born on Sukkot, that takes you to Shemini Atzeret. The eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And where is he when he's being circumcised? He is in the temple shedding his blood, confirming the covenant to Abraham. On the eighth day. God is the perfect uh, uh, orchestra, director. How can this, I mean, this just shows you there has to be a God. Look at Luke 2, 22 through 24. It says, when the days of their purification, according to the Torah of Moses, were fulfilled. So what were they doing during his time? They were following the Torah. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the Torah of the Lord, that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the Torah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, do you know that is not, that's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. Where do you think you're going to find the whole truth? By going to the Torah, because it says they follow the Torah. So let's go to Leviticus 12, 6 and 8. It says, when the days of our purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she has to bring what? A lamb of the first year is actually what was required for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. But if they're poor, if they are so poor, she's not able to afford to bring a lamb. Well, then she can bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest will make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Okay, so what were they supposed to bring? But they couldn't afford a lamb, which also tells you the three magi hadn't come with the money yet. Okay, 
And what else do we see? They were poor. They wished they had had a lamb. They did. They had the lamb of God. They had the lamb of God. They didn't need the lamb. Isn't that just mind-blowing? What time is it? Okay, I'll go just a little bit longer. Now, again, Leviticus 23, 33. I'm just going to real quickly highlight some things. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. On the 15th day of this seventh month is the feast of booze for how many days? Okay. The 15th day of the seventh month. That is Tishri. But what else happens on the 15th day of any month? Full moon. So he was born on a full moon in the light of day. Now, Look at this. Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 15. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. And the day with the Lord is a thousand years. And for 7,000 years, we're dwelling in temporary tabernacles. Okay. But look at this. It says, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in your corn and your wine and you What? shall rejoice. That's a command. It, it, your, God is commanding you to rejoice. Can you imagine that? If you were depressed, that's tough. You have to rejoice because my son's going to be born and we're going to have a party and I want everyone to rejoice. In your feast, you, your son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, Levite, stranger, fatherless, widow, Seven days you shall keep a solemn feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God shall choose because the Lord your God is going to bless you in all your increase and in all the works of your hands. Therefore, you shall what? Can you imagine a commandment to be happy for seven days? That's got to be hard for some people. Now, look at Luke 23 through 40. It says, on the first day, you're to take the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and again, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. These are the uh, lulavs and the etrogs that we've ordered for those that want them, and they'll be coming in shortly. And then look at Leviticus 23, 41 through 44. You have to keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. It's a statute forever throughout your generations. You're to keep it in the seventh month. You have to dwell in booths. For seven days, all who are native born in Israel shall dwell in booths. That your generation may know, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. And so Moses declared this to the children of Israel, the appointed feast of the Lord. Okay, I'll be teaching more about this on Sukkot coming up here in a couple of weeks. Look at Zechariah 14. Notice three times he said they have to dwell in booths. Well, look what's coming to a planet near you. In Zechariah 14, 14 through 19, Judah will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the nations are going to be gathered together, the gold, the silver, apparel, and great abundance. Why? If you remember, they plundered the pagans at Passover. They got all the Egyptian stuff. Well, that's going to be a pattern. It's going to repeat again, and all the nations are going to end up bringing their gold and silver and great abundance to Israel. And it says, so will be the plague of the horse, mule, camel, donkey, and all the beasts shall be in these tents is this plague and it'll come to pass everyone that is left of all the nations so in other words here are your humans that are going to survive the tribulation which came against jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king the lord of hosts and to do what keep the feast of tabernacles and whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to jerusalem and worship the king the lord of hosts they get no rain and if the family of egypt doesn't come they not only get no rain, but they also get the plague wherewith the Lord is going to smite all the heathen that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, do we get the idea we're supposed to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? Three times. But, of course, we can only do what we can do, so we do what we can do as a memorial and as a reminder of what the feast is all about. It's reading how to ride a bicycle won't help you ride a bicycle. Studying the feast will not help you. You need to do the feast. Then you really begin to understand what they mean. Let me show you this. In 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables 
when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, we were eyewitnesses. Peter saw the second coming in a vision. Look at Matthew 17, 4. When it happened, Peter said to Yeshua at the transfiguration, Lord, it's good for us to be here, if you will. Let us make here three, what? Tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, that's three Sukkot, three tabernacles. Peter saw his coming will be at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he's building three uh, Sukkahs. It's not going to happen in the spring. All these fall feasts will be fulfilled in the fall. Okay, Exodus 25, 8 and 9. He says, let him make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to the pattern of the tabernacle. God always uses patterns. We have to learn his pattern. Revelation 21, 1 through 4, what do we see? John says, I saw the city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. This is why Zechariah 14, that's to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, because Yeshua is going to be here at the Feast of Tabernacles and he'll reign for a thousand years. And the tabernacle of God is with men. Numbers 29, 12, and 13. On the 15th day of the 17th month, it goes on to say that they're to offer 13 bulls from the herd. Why do they offer the 13 bulls? Anyone know why? On the first day, they're to offer 13 bulls. It goes on by the eighth or seventh day, they've offered 70 bulls. Okay? They're to offer 13, then 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. And it comes to 70 bulls. Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. They would make atonement for themselves. So five days later on Sukkot, they would make atonement for the 70 nations. So Yom Kippur is only about Israel. It's not about anyone else. And Sukkot is all about the nations. God having Israel as the priests of the world making atonement for the nations. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the sages often say that if the nations had only known what God was doing for them during Sukkot, making atonement, they never would have destroyed the temple. They'd have put their armies around it to protect it. But isn't that smart? The devil uses the very thing we hate and want to destroy is the very thing that could have helped us. So we'll close with this. Let me just say that uh, the celebrations in the temple, like I said, there are over 2 million people in Jerusalem. And those who arrived there came to what? Rejoice. All right. Uh, the focus was the water libation. In the temple, there was this women's court. You can see the big candlesticks. There were four of those. And that's where the priests would get ladders and they would climb up and they'd have uh, like seven gallon barrels of oil and they would use it to dump into those. They'd have the priestly garments cut in strips for wicks. But it was a huge party. This is the women's court. The women were in the elevated balconies there. And then the men were down dance, dancing down below. There'd be these two priests that are coming and they'd be blowing shofars literally all night long. The events would go and there'd be millions of people there. So here they would all be building sukkahs. There were sukkahs built all over Jerusalem, all the way to Bethlehem. They had sukkahs. Everyone's supposed to be in a sukkah. And then look at Exodus 15 too. It says, the Lord is my strength and my song and he's become what? Remember, this is the song at the sea when they crossed the Red Sea during Passover week. And what do we find? Psalms 118, which is the Hallel, which they sing. That has the same verse. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has what? Become my salvation. And so what do we see during that week? They not only sing Psalm 118, they also sing Isaiah 12, 2. Why? Because Isaiah 12, 2 is the only other place where it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For God, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. And what happens? That happens on the Feast of Tabernacles. God has become their Yeshua. And what else do we see? The next verses. Therefore, with joy, will you draw water out of the wells of salvation or Yeshua. That's why in John chapter 7, when they were all singing, 
they were singing, this is what they were singing. And the minute they sang, with joy will you draw waters out of the wells of salvation, that's when Yeshua interrupted the whole song service and said, yes, as this scripture says, whoever comes to me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It was on the feast of Sukkot when they're singing this that he interrupts them in John chapter 7. This is what they're singing. Why is that so amazing? Because look at the last verse. There's only six verses. The very next thing. On the Feast of Tabernacles. Cry and shout out, you inhabitant of Zion, for great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Here he was born in Sukkot. Now he's ministering as an adult and he interrupts their song service and he says, yes, come to me. Well, guess what? Now they have to finish the song and it is cry and shout out, great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Unless you know the Hebraic roots and haven't followed replacement theology, you're never going to see all this. But wait, there's more. I'll teach you on Sukkot. So then you rejoice in the Torah. And that's what they're doing. They're rejoicing in the living Torah, Messiah, during the Feast of Sukkot. This is why he couldn't have been born on Passover. All right? But look at this. I'm closing with this. How many years in a Shemitah cycle? Okay, I want all of you online to record this. Watch it. Put it in your notes. Don't forget it. Because this isn't in your notes. Okay, there's seven years in a Shemitah cycle, right? Okay, so I have down here. 1911, 1912, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1917 was a Shemitah year. Now, the first thing, people use this, but there's a big problem with this. Some people will say uh, 1917 was a Jubilee year, and so was 1967, which is 50 years later, because they see in 1917, was World War I and Jerusalem was recaptured and 67 Jerusalem's recaptured and that's 50 years apart. So they say that must be a Jubilee year. Wrong. Completely wrong. As you look at the Shemitah years, everyone knows 2001 was a Shemitah year, but here's the problem with this calendar. How many of you knew, know God does not use our pagan Gregorian calendar? If you say that 2001 was a Shemitah year, you have to ask yourself, well, was it the first nine months of 2001 or the last three months of 2001? Because a biblical year begins at Rosh Hashanah, which is in September, October. So 2001, in one sense, can't be a Shemitah year because you haven't defined it enough. Is it the first half of 2001 or the last half of 2001? So anyone that gives you a calendar date based on our years, they don't know what they're talking about. You following me? Okay, but we're going to pretend we're going to use this for the moment because that's what people use that don't know what they're talking about. Okay, but 2001, people recognize as a Shemitah year, and 2008, and 2015, and last, uh, the year before, 2022, was a Shemitah year. Pretty much everybody believes that it was a Shemitah year. Now, the way you know it was a Shemitah year on the biblical calendar Okay, we've now entered 5784. So what was this past year? 5783. And what was the year before that? 82. Well, we know 5782 was a Shemitah year because 5782 is divisible by seven. Christians make it too hard. We also know 5782 was the 49th year of the seven sevens because 5782 is also divisible by 49. So if 5782 is divisible by 49, the following year is a Jubilee year, which means we've just left a Jubilee year of 5783 and we're now entering 5784. Okay, is everyone following me so far? Kind of, hopefully. Now, there are people prophetic people in the messianic world who are convinced that 1917 was a jubilee year 1967 was a jubilee year therefore 2017 has to be a jubilee year that's nuts just because they're 50 years apart i mean if you've been married 50 years does that mean your first year was a year of jubilee and your 50th year is a year of jubilee biblically 
No, it just means 50 years have gone by. The reason 2017 can't be a Jubilee year is because it's the second year of a Shemitah cycle. How can, how can a Jubilee year be in the middle of a Shemitah cycle? It has to be at the end of a Shemitah cycle the following year. You follow, is everyone following me? Okay, who's not following me? I want to explain it. Okay. This is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The second, the third, the fourth, the sixth, the seventh. What is seven times seven? Which means that next year is a Jubilee year. So therefore, none of the Shemitah years can be a Jubilee year. Are you following me? Because it's the seventh year. It's supposed to be following a Shemitah cycle. It's the 50th year. 50, 50 is not a multiple of seven. Okay, so you have seven, and another seven, another seven, another, and you do seven sevens, and then the next year is the Jubilee year. That next year is the first year of a new cycle. Okay, and so 2023, what we just left was the 50th year after you do the seven times seven. The 50th year is also the first year of the next cycle. It's not a separate year. Just like the Sabbath, uh, you can't add... uh, Moomba Boomba Day, okay, in the counting of the Omer. I mean, the, the fir- just like Sunday is the first day of the week, it's also the eighth day of the week. You follow me? So the Jubilee year was never a separate year. It was always the first year uh, after the seven sevens. So last year was a Jubilee year because the Jubilee years have to be in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. They can't be in the seventh year. So... Anyway, I just wanted to put this chart so you could see why the year of Jubilee could never be 1917, could never be 2017. It's all about the math. Okay, how in the world could a Jubilee ever be the second year of a Shemitah cycle? It can't. So 2017, 1967, 1917 could never be biblical Jubilees. Jubilees are not based on a January to January calendar, as I just said. How in the world could a Shemitah year also be a year of Jubilee? So do you see how dumb it is if you're not following the math? Now let me show you one more thing about people who believe he was born at Passover instead of Sukkot. I have so many biblical reasons, but I'm going to give you one of the smartest reasons that prove how dumb it is to think he was born at Passover. How many years did he minister? Three and a half, right? Well, get a load of this. He was three and a half years that he ministered. And it says, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. If he ministered three and a half years and he was about 30 years old, it says he began his ministry right at his birthday. That's what it says. And we know he began on the first of a lull. For 40 days, he was in the wilderness, comes out on Yom Kippur. Okay, and what do we see? If he was actually born at Passover, his ministry would have started at Passover. So he has one Passover, two Passover, three Passovers, and the half a year says he dies on Sukkot then. That doesn't work. But if he was born on Sukkot and started his ministry on Sukkot and he ministers three and a half years, he now dies on Passover. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. It's so much common sense as to why he wasn't born on Passover, as some famous people say. He was born on Sukkot. Okay, with that said, let's stand. And next week, I'm going to talk about replacement theology concerning the Shabbat versus Sunday. Sorry, it went a little long. I just had a lot to had to cover. Okay, let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah and man, studying the light of the Torah, studying the New Testament in the light of the first covenant. We find all kinds of things. We need to connect the dots. Father, help us all connect the dots. And, and again, I just thank you so much for all of those people that are helping carry the light of your Torah to the nations of the world. Your Torah is still valid. Father, we thank you for your laws. We don't Uh, want to be afraid of your laws we know therefore are good which is why even in the priestly blessing you not only want to bless us you want to put your name upon us 
as you told Moses to tell Aaron, Ivarekeka Adonai Ba'ish Mareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. Ye saw Adonai Panavileka Viasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in that wonderful name. Aye, Asher, Aye. Amen. We'll see you later, but don't forget to put your prayer requests in the offering box so we can pray for you and any financial needs you have.